Glad to be here. Um, you know that um, Matt Fred was supposed to be here, yeah? And uh, he's, uh, he's from Australia, yeah? I'm not. <laughs> I, um, I knew that he was supposed to be here. Actually, I got a call from Zach. Where's Zach? Right there in the back. Zach called me at night in my hotel room. I was in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And he called me and he said, hey, uh, Matt Frad had to cancel. We'd like you to speak. And I thought I was being pranked. So I laughed at him and I said, oh, who is this? And he's like, oh, this is Zach from Iowa. I'm like, oh, sorry for laughing in your face just now. Uh, so I called Matt Frad and I asked him if I could use his accent for the weekend. And he said, yes, but not all of it. I could just use 30 seconds of it. So I, oh yeah, it's up. That's all I got. So my name's Nick Davidson. Um, <laughs> you don't understand. As a speaker, I've been dying to make a Matt Frad joke forever. And so as soon as he called, I'm like, this is it. This is my chance. I'm so excited. So um, just one disclaimer. I, I lost my voice a week and a half ago. This is the clearest it has been in, in over, over a week. So if you can't understand me, it's not you. It's me. Second, um, the two gentlemen who have been here the longest, like maybe on one of the breaks, it'd be cool to kind of see them fight, like just wrestle. Because I was waiting for the guy to be like, okay, who, like to find out who's been the longest. And I feel like because you guys are by each other, there might be some rivalry. So maybe at lunch or something, we could get a little pay-per-view going. No? Okay, the one who's saying no loses. We have a winner right there. That's awesome. Uh, so my name is Nick. I am originally from Duluth, Minnesota. Um, I travel and speak right now. My wife and I are missionaries. Um, we've lived in China. We lived in the Caribbean. Um, and we're only stateside right now because my wife is doing her medical residency. So she's, um, she's four months away from being done with this 11-year process. Um, we, did, we adopted three kids when we were on the island. And um, we were, we've been married 17 years, never able to have kids. Uh, and then about... 15 months ago, my wife had a baby. And uh, so we adopted these kids, and then we had a baby, so that's awesome. And then, so we're just trying to accumulate children in any way we can. So if you guys are frustrated at all, you can just ditch them on us. We're, I'm sure my wife would love that. Um, I'm trying to think of any other background that would matter. I did not grow up Catholic. I grew up in the denomination called the Assemblies of God. Um, so I, I grew up very anti-Catholic, actually. I never went to a Catholic mass until I was 28. I never met a Catholic person that I know of until I was 28. Um, and so I know a lot of people, you're cradle Catholics. You don't know what it's like to... Some of you guys are super Catholic. Like, you're, whole, like you're born at mass. <laughs> like your mom had you and cut the cord and the priest just kept going because, no, uh, that's them again. <laughs> there's like, th yeah, you can't stop the mass and there's like 30 of them at their pew. So... I walked into my first mass for the first time at 28. I didn't know what to expect. Um, I had heard a lot of, <laughs> I was joked that we told my family where we were gonna be in case we never came back. Like in case you guys burn us at the stake right away or um, do you have to bring your own goat to sacrifice or do they give you a goat? I didn't know. So our first mass was just, just totally different. It wasn't that it was entertaining, but it was different than we had ever heard, seen before. Um, and the priest, the priest walked in and I don't know exactly what I, Expected, but somewhere around like 147 years old on a hover round, just <laughs> there'd be a ramp he could drive up on stage. But it wasn't. It, oh, and Father, wherever Father is, if you have a hover round, that's fine. I, I'm not. I would like a hover round. That'd be fine. But I just didn't expect a priest to be a young guy. I didn't really expect a priest. Because uh, all I knew was celibacy. So I didn't know that a young guy would be interested in what I thought was just celibacy. Um, and so our first mass kind of blew our, he blew our heads open. Like we, the priest was talking about the band U2, and I love the band U2. And uh, I was like, they let priests listen to music? That's cool. Okay. And so afterwards, we got in line to meet the priest, and we shook his hand. Uh, and I said, hi, my name's Nick. Uh, I was a missionary to China. And he said, oh, I was engaged to a missionary to China. And I'm like, what is going on? Like, Priests don't date. They come out of the womb with a collar on, and they go in the priest baby pile, and they go off to priest seminary, I guess, baby seminary. Like, everything about that night just blew my head open. So I asked the guy if he would ever meet for coffee and just answer some questions. So I don't know if you know who Father Mike Schmitz is, but that's the first priest I ever met. I know. 
So for the next five months from 10 to midnight, every, every, every Tuesday night from 10 to midnight, we would, you're going to want to, you're going to want to turn that phone off. You know what the funniest thing is as a speaker? The funniest thing for me is making fun of people who leave their phone on. But you know what I have found across the country? It's never the youth. <laughs> Ever. Not one teenager's phone has ever gone off. It's always a certain demographic of people who are just now learning about phones without cords on them. <laughs> and so often, it will be, now this guy was, you were on it, you're like, rah, rah, rah. but so often it'll just keep ringing and the person has no clue. And every teenager around him is like, come on, your phone. And they're like, yeah, this is good music, isn't it? <laughs> it's awesome. I love it when a phone goes off. Thank you. Somebody call him in about three minutes <laughs> just to see if he turned his silence on. So anyway, we went to this mass and we met Father Mike and we started to meet every week for five months from 10 to midnight. And every question I ever had about theology, about scripture, about morality, ethics, history, I was just throwing at the church. And he answered every one of them with humility and with the power that the church has to be able to say, uh, for 2,000 years, that is what it has been. Well, what about baptizing babies? Well, for 2,000 years. And um, instead of it being his personal opinion, it was always just, this is what Christianity has always done. And one of the first things he talked about on that first night that I ever went to a Mass, he, was, he had just come back from a week-long training on theology of the body. And um, I didn't know what that was. I had no clue. My wife and I had never heard about it. And so we got invited to go to, he, he asked us one night, why don't you come to Theology of the Body, T-O-B, and I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing a four-week series. Now, we missed the first two weeks, and we showed up to late, late to the third one because my wife and... We walked out 45 minutes later just completely transformed. Like a complete, I mean, our, our marriage, now there was a lot of change that had to happen. There was a lot of chaos that came into our life because of it. But we had been married about six and a half years and our marriage was, was tanking, but we couldn't figure out why. I couldn't figure out why we couldn't make it work. We wanted to. I wanted to love correctly. My wife wanted to love correctly. but We couldn't seem to make it work right. And we were just butting heads all the time. And we, we got to the point where, like, you just couldn't talk about it. It was just hopeless. Now, I grew up, when, so I grew up, like most of us here, before there was the internet, before there was any of that. So when I was eight years old, I was walking in the woods, and my buddy and I discovered porn. And I want to make a pause. Normally, I'm doing youth events, and, well, even adult events. If you mention porn in a room, suddenly all the men in the room are like, what is this porn you speak of? There's naked, that is horrible. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell my mom, I'm telling somebody. Like, there's this automatic face that comes on, like, oh, I, what, no, I, I wouldn't. But the national average to view pornography is seven years old, uh, and that's the average. So sometimes it's younger, sometimes it's older. But everyone in this room has seen pornography. If they haven't chosen to, they have seen it. But most of us have chosen to. Most of us have had some moments of brokenness, even if it's not an addiction. We had that as an influence in our, in our life. And as a kid, as an eight-year-old kid, my buddy and I discovered, oh, by the way, I was at this church, and I said that sentence that I just said, that I discovered porn. And this group of girls in the front just laughed, and then they kept laughing, and it was kind of awkward, and eventually they got it under control. And after I got done speaking, they came up really quickly. And they're like, hey, I just wanted to let you know, we weren't trying to be rude. When you said porn, we thought you said corn. So then you started saying how everybody gets addicted to corn and people look at corn at a young age and the influence of corn. And I was like, oh, that's the best thing ever. I am so glad that that happened to you guys. So I'm going to use the word corn for the rest of the day, if that's okay. But no, at eight years old, when my buddy and I, you're not sexual at that time, you're just innocent, but you find this and you begin to receive an education on what love looks like, what relationships look like, what life in this body should look like. And I don't know about you, but then I would go home to my house and my parents, I didn't know my real dad until I turned 18. He was an alcoholic, he was abusive. So I had a dad growing up that my mom married, he was my dad, but my mom and dad just fought every day of their marriage until they divorced. They just fought all the time and then they divorced. So I, I had that and then I had my parents. Then I had that and then I had, you know, my aunts and uncles who are addicts and abusive and totally broken. And then I had that. 
And I'm getting an education from both sides. And I had my grandparents who are they're in their 80s right now and they still hate each other. But it's not like cute, cute old person hate. It's like, like hate. They hate each other. And they always have hated each other. And so I saw all of this at home and I saw this. And what, without even knowing it, as a kid, you make a decision where you're going to receive your education from. And there's no way on earth I ever wanted to be like anything I saw at home. So the alternative is this. And as you get older, you hit high school, you know, you, you hit puberty, you hit adolescence, and all that begins. And there's this flood of feeling and force behind it. And it feels like this raging thing inside. And you find, okay, well, then I'm going to do everything I can to have a relationship like that then. If these are my alternatives, if, this is, if, if I can live like this or I can live like this, then that is what I'm going to live like. So as soon as I could, that's what I tried for. And again, some of it was just lust. Some of it was just wanting a real relationship, trying to find it, and that's the only way that I saw. At least it's the most attractive way that I saw. And what that brought into my life was just utter brokenness. Now, porn wasn't an issue in my marriage. I, I received a real grace from porn the day I knew that I would ask my wife to marry me. But that doesn't mean that my mentality changed, because porn is a mentality. It's, it's not, porn is not just looking at images of two people. P porn is not that. It's the mentality behind it. It's one of objectifying and of use. And I took that with me right into marriage, right into my relationship with my wife. It, I, it took me through every dating relationship that I ruined. It took me through dating my wife, through our engagement, into our marriage. And I just brought that right in. The idea of, like, well, you're mine. I mean, I'll do all of this. I'll work all day. I'll clean. I'll do all the things you asked me to. Then this is mine, though. Like, I'll do all of these things. I'll give and give and give, but then you're mine. And that was the mentality. And that, that informed everything I did without knowing it. The porn mentality doesn't just affect sex. It affects the way you view the world. Because if one person can be an object for you, and you don't, you don't couch that, you don't stop that, then everybody becomes an object for you. And without knowing it, as humans, not just men, but as humans, we do this. Every, the whole world becomes our ATM. You meet somebody and you immediately think, okay, what buttons do I have to push to get what I want? And we do that most with our spouse, with our wife. Like, well, I know, I know the way I have to behave, the things I have to do to get the things that I want. And all that is, is punching numbers into an ATM. The problem with an ATM is when the ATM stops working, you just find a new ATM. No one has ever gone to an ATM to get cash and it's broken. They'll be like, well, I will wait for you forever. <laughs> you are my ATM. <laughs> this is the only ATM for me. We don't do that. Why? Because if it's broken, you just immediately start looking for another ATM. Without realizing it, we do that as humans to each other. We view people as what we can get from them. And because of it, when, we can't, when, our, when our button punching doesn't work, then we just try to find a new one. We do that with everything. We do that with jobs. We do that with friends. We do that with, we do that with God. But we do it with our spouses as well. The thing is, I didn't know I was doing it. Most of us don't know that that is what we're doing. And so I had gotten to the point in our marriage where I was like, I don't think this is going to turn out well. I want it to, but I don't know how to make it work. And um, I started to feel really doomed. I started to feel really damned. Internally, I wouldn't have said it, I wouldn't have admitted it, but I didn't see a way out. Some of you guys might be like that. Where, and I'm not just talking porn again, like just in general, the idea of like, I feel kind of trapped in my life and I'm not sure what to do about it. I want to encourage you, like you're not doomed. No one is doomed. No one is damned. No one is stuck where we are. Nobody. It's impossible. If God is real, then we're not stuck. You cannot be stuck. You cannot be trapped. Because there is always hope. There is always a way out. And it actually ends up being way different than you thought it would. It ends up being way easier than you thought it would be. But the problem is, uh, one of the things is we have to learn to understand ourselves. See, I didn't get myself. I, I don't know if you believe, like, have you ever seen The Simpsons? That's an older show, but some of us watch The Simpsons. I speak to a lot of youth, and they're like, the what? I'm like, so I feel old now. Um, the Simpsons was this cartoon show in the like 80s, 90s. But Homer Simpson became like the image of what a man should be, for, or, or image of what a man is in our generation. It was just this, duh. That was, that was Homer Simpson. Don't. Everything was, don't. Everything was stupidity. And if we're honest, we kind of buy into that. The thing is, we are actually really complex people, men. Men are very complex. At, at the same time, we're, we're dumb, but we're also complex. We have to also be willing to, like, I've been married 17 years, and I, I don't know if I will ever learn that my wife wants salt and napkins. 
Like she just wants them. I don't, I don't know why so bad. I don't understand it. Wherever we are, she's like, did you get me salt and napkins? I'm like, no, why? We're at the beach. What do you need? I don't understand. What's going on? We're on a bike ride. Why would you need salt and napkins? But she always, and it's been 17 years. We'll go to a movie, and I'll, I'll show up with the popcorn. She's in the, the I was going to call it a pew. She's in the seat, and she's, I get the popcorn, the juice, the candy, the gum, everything she asked for. And I'll get done and be like, oh, and she'll be like, did you bring me salt and napkins, you idiot? So then I have to go all the way back. So there are aspects of us, I know, that take a long time, and that's okay. Like, there's certain parts of us. That's why I love Peter in Scripture. Peter is, like, just a man's man, 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 man. Just, uh, <laughs> all the time. I love it because he's very impetuous, he's bold, but he's also just dumb as a post. So there are parts of us that are, that are, that are not intricate at all. But, the, like, the inner workings of the male, of the masculine, it's actually very complex. It's actually insanely amazing. And, and what, I, what we need to do is to understand that before we try to move forward as men. We have to understand ourselves. So I didn't have a good relationship with my dad. He didn't teach me anything growing up. Like, so I, I learned things as I went. I didn't learn, nobody taught me how to drive a stick. I just kind of learned how to drive a stick really poorly. And my, so my grandpa, he rides a motorcycle. He's like, he's like the good influence in my life, my grandpa. He was like my dad. My grandpa has ridden his motorcycle in every state in the Union and so we, uh, that you can get to with a motorcycle. And so I used to ride with him all the time when I was younger. We'd go on motorcycle rides, and I'd ride everywhere with him all around the country. But then I got older, I was driving, and my grandma, she drove a trike. Do you know what a trike? Like the, you know, the full-on, like this. She had a Volkswagen engine in this trike, and it was blaze red with fire on the back, and it said Mama's Machine on it. <laughs> and my grandma wore leather and chaps and that weird hat, and I was terrified of my grandma. <laughs> Only when she had the leather outfit on, she would just come walking out of the house, and she was never like that, but then she'd get on the trike and pop the, it was crazy. So one day, my grandma said, or my, my grandpa said, like, instead of riding on the back, why don't you take grandma's trike? I'm like, I, oh, okay, and I didn't want to, I was embarrassed, I didn't want to be like, I don't know how to drive that trike. He's like, ah, oh, just take it, it's no big deal, we're on the back roads. <laughs> okay. It's your trike. So I got on it, and, and he just takes off. So, you know, I turned it on, and I don't know how I got out of the driveway. I don't remember how I got out of the driveway, but eventually I was moving quite quickly down this road. And, um, and so at, we drive for a while, and it's fine once you're up to speed. But then he wanted to pull over and hang out for a little bit. My grandpa likes to stop and, like, look at things. So we would stop and look, look at something. We pulled over in this little parking lot, and we're looking at, I guess, the woods. And he's like, ah, oh, that was good. Let's go. And I'm like, okay, I don't, I don't know if this is going to go well a second time. I think I was playing the odds the first time. And I got on and just killed it, popped it. And he was, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't, I don't actually know, Grandpa. He's like, well, just take, you lead. I'm like, I don't want to lead. And he's like, just take off. And I, the thing was bouncing, and I was shuddering through the, and I kept killing it. And, and my grandpa's like, what are you doing? I was like, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't, Grandpa, I don't know how to drive a stick. He said, well, how did you get here? I'm like, I have no earthly clue. <laughs> you should have asked that before you told me to drive the thing. And so my grandpa, when, I mean, at that point, I was like 23 years old. My grandpa had to sit down and be like, okay. And he had to explain what a transmission was and what a clutch did and all of it. He had to explain it to me. And it takes like 30 seconds to understand. But he had never explained it to me. So all the while, I'm trying to work this complicated machinery I had no clue how to do it. And as men, we, I don't know, it just, we get bowled over by the lies of this culture. The lies that we are just like, I don't know, this horny beast. Or that we are this animal inside that we can't restrain or that we, but we should restrain. We get all these weird lies about us that we're just, we are as dumb as a post and that's it. And we just need to be told what to do or we're hapless and hopeless. That's a lie too. We're actually fundamentally very, very complex we're intricate, and the passions that drive us drive the world. I mean, the, the vast majority of so much of human accomplishment has been done by these people who are supposedly dumb as a post. The problem is we don't get ourselves. We don't understand. And as a guy, like I said, I had a no father as an example. I had a completely and utterly distant father. I mean, like, we just never, ever spoke. I don't remember a conversation with him till the day he moved out. I don't remember anything. And so as a, an understanding of what a guy should be, 
I got either you should be violent or you should be distant. I got to college. I didn't, I didn't understand God the Father. Why would I want to have any relationship with a father who was anything like my father's? And so we learn about God. We learn about men from our dads. And that's, that's a travesty sometimes. We learn from our culture. We learn from the media. We learn from movies. We learn from just like blindly letting go of what comes from inside of us. And all the while, we just kind of end up pretty darn messed up because of it. And I know I'm painting a rough, rough picture. People are like, wow, he was funny for like three seconds. And uh, now it's getting really tense. If there's a break, I'm leaving, right? I'm going to cut his brake line in the parking lot, and then I'm out of here. So that's not funny in Iowa. Okay, in Minnesota, <laughs> for some reason in Minnesota, when you make a brake line joke, everybody's like, ah, because we're psycho up there, I guess. But if we're going to understand ourselves, we just start after, we have to start asking questions. We do. We have to ask why. You get up in the morning and you just ask, well, why? What am I doing here? And some of you guys are asking that now. Like, why am I here? What am I doing here? But I mean, in general, in life, you have to, we're kind of afraid to do that. Get up in the morning, sit at the edge of your bed before you get up and just say, okay, what am I doing here? Why am I getting out of bed? I think we don't ask that question because we're terrified of it. Well, what if there's no reason? What, seriously, what if I just got up and I'm supposed to be a consumer? What if I'm here to just get a job and accumulate? What if that's all there is? Why am I here? What am I doing? You guys know um, it's a very obscure sports player named Tom Brady? Have you heard of him? He plays Quidditch, I think, or rugby, some sport, I don't Tom Brady, you can look on YouTube. Years ago, um, there's an interview with him on 60 Minutes. And it's when he had three Super Bowl rings at the time, so it was a while ago. And the interviewer says, Tom, you've done pretty well for yourself. You have three Super Bowl rings. you got a $60 million contract. That's got to be pretty amazing. And Tom Brady unabashedly says, yeah, I guess. I don't know. I keep asking myself, am I just here to win Super Bowl rings? And it gets kind of awkward. He's like, no, I'm serious. I just keep thinking, God, there's got to be more out there than this for me. And the interviewer says, well, Tom, what's the answer? And without hesitation, Tom Brady says, I wish I knew. I wish I knew. Just like that. This is Tom Brady, $60 million. He's set for life. And he's, he's unabashedly saying, I don't know. This, there's got to be more than just winning Super Bowl rings. And as men, we, we, we get tired when we're young of not asking the question because we don't have the answer. So we stop asking it, and we just try to plow through life. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna keep my family together. I'm gonna pay the bills. I'm just gonna do this until I die. And we start our rigor mortis really, really early. We do. If you think about, it, you come home and your wife's like, "Are you okay?" You're like, "I'm just fine. I'm fine." Are you stressed? No, it's all okay. I got it taken care of. It's like, no, you don't. You have Bell's palsy. That's what you have right now. You're having a seizure. But we do as men. We're like, I got it. I got it. We don't even know what we're getting. We have no clue sometimes what we're gripping on with our whole life. And actually, if we could just as men learn to ask and answer that question off the bat, life would be amazing. If you could just know every morning when you get out of bed why you're getting out of bed, that would change everything. So first we have to ask the question, why, just in general, why humanity? You know that there, we didn't have to exist. When there was nothing and God invented us, we didn't have to be like we are. It could have been just nature. God invented us on purpose. And we never even asked that question, why, why are we here? We just, we think, oh God, I don't know, God's this weird creature, and he made us to like march in step, just do what we're told. That's why God made humans. He was bored, and he's like, I just want something to be mad at, so I'm going to make humans. If you've ever been honest, we think of God that way, right? Like I'm down here, and he's just waiting for me to screw up, and when I do, he's like, ah, and send straight to hell. Ah, you're going to hell. Another one's going to hell. This is awesome. This is what I did. This is my purpose. God didn't do that. But there's got to be a reason, right? God can't do anything accidentally, right? We don't think God can make a mistake that he's just like doodling and messing with clay. He's like, oh, well, they're going to go out that way. We'll see how it goes. No, we know that we are on purpose. So that means when there was no humanity and God made humanity, there was a purpose for humans. And if we believe that that purpose is to march in step, just to do the right thing, that's miserable. That's not life at all. That's not life. If we are just here to do the right thing and to stay in line and keep God off our back, that's not life. There's a reason that that gets empty. There's a reason as Catholics, when you go to church on Sunday, look, look around this Sunday at Mass. It's the scariest day of my week. 
Look around. Everybody looks so constipated every day. Every mess. Just the sign of peace is the worst, scariest moment. I dread it all week. Because we stand up and you're like, yeah, and people are like, peace be with you. Like, everybody looks possessed and angry and sorrowful. I'm like, this is, this is mass. This is everything in the world. And they're like, I'm so happy to be here. That's what, look around. You'll see it this Sunday. But that, you know what that comes from? That comes from not knowing why you're there. We spend our whole lives like that because we don't know why we're here. As humans, just trying to accumulate, find a relationship, find a good house. Those are things you have to do. And if not, you're a failure. You're, you know, you're miserable. You're hopeless. And all the while, we, see, we think, well, maybe there's got to be more than this for me. There's got to be more out there than this for me. And God shows us in the first moments of Scripture why he made humans. I don't know if you've ever been told this. Do you know why humanity in general exists? The reason God made humans was not, I have chores that I need done, so I'm going to make like a bunch of worker drones. That's not why he made us. He wouldn't, didn't make us because he was lonely. He didn't make us because he had some lack that we needed to fill. God made humanity so that we could be in relationship with him. That's it. Human, humans were made to be in relationship with God. That is why you are here. Till your last breath, you exist on this earth to be in relationship with him. That is the one thing that matters most. It is the only thing that lasts through your death into eternity, but it's the only thing that fulfills here is your relationship with God. And you've tried to find meaning in your job. We try. And we come home and we're still frustrated. Ah, I used to like it. I don't like it. I don't know. You've tried to find meaning in relationships. Yeah, it was great in the beginning, and now it's just tough and difficult, and it doesn't give me what it gave me before. We look around, and we start to get afraid we're never going to find that purpose. And all the while, the purpose is just him. That's it. We know about it because right at the very beginning, when he makes humans, we see what he wanted from humans. I don't know if you guys remember, some of you guys are a little, you're like me, I just turned 40 on Monday, so I, I'm forgetting things, and I'm blending my food now, and I have an afghan that I sit with every night, and an empty pipe. Anyway, back when you first met the one, back when you first started to fall, like you saw the person down the hallway, or you saw them at work, or you're in the grocery store, or wherever you saw her in the field, it's Iowa, so across the field I saw them. What's she doing in the field? I don't know. So you guys. And right when you first meet somebody, this thing happens. You want to do something with them that I've never understood. And it's not that. That I understand. What you guys are thinking, I get it. There's this first thing that happens. When you get into a relationship and you just start almost across the board, people, the one thing they start doing is you will go on walks together. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of in my life. I hate walking. It's dumb. I can see the thing. I don't need to walk over to it. I'm just going to stay right here. But you, you remember that? You start dating, and she's like, what do you want to do? You're like, I don't care. I'll just, just walk. Where do you want to walk? I don't care. There. Do you remember? You'll walk for hours. Do you remember going on hours and hours? And you, as long as I can hold your hand. <laughs> Why? Go inside and sit on a couch. It's so much more relaxing than going on a walk. I'll walk through rain and sleet. Why? There's roofs everywhere. Go under one of the roofs. But there's something about it, of just walking for hours. And there's, there's a reason for that. Look in the first pages of Scripture. The first moments of humanity, God creates Adam and Eve, male and female, and he would walk with them in the cool of the day. Isn't that awesome? It's in Scripture. And nowhere does Scripture say, and I will check in with you to make sure you're doing all the things that I left on the list, and if not, I shall send you to hell. All it is is he would walk with them. Because that's all God has ever wanted to do, is just be in a relationship with you. That's it. That's what he made you for. He made humans to be in communion with him. That's it. That's why the source and summit of our faith is communion. That is why body, blood, soul, and divinity becoming one with us is the source and summit of our faith because that's all he ever wanted in the first place. Sin just distanced us. I found the Catholic Church, and I'm like, this is all personal, intimate relationship. Baptism, you're physically made one. You're adopted into God's family. Confession, you're, you're distant because of your sin, and you confess physically with your mouth, and you are made one with God again. 
The creed. Do you guys know the creed? We say it every Sunday. It's that when we're like, Oh, and then as your parents, you're like, Do you know that one, right? That's the whole creed. Wait. There, that was the whole creed. We do that every Sunday. And if you ask them, what's the creed? I, I guess it's like what we believe. No, it's not. The creed, when we say the creed on Sunday, that is we state who we believe in, not what we believe. The creed is, I believe in God the Father, the Father who loves me. I believe in the Son who died for me. I believe in the Holy Spirit who is in me. We believe in a relationship. And I realized at one point that as Catholics, we have the ability to have the most personal, intimate relationship with God possible in this universe. That is why humanity exists. Men, that's why you were made. To know God. That's it. That's why you're here. That's why God made humans. So first and foremost, that's why. That's why you're here. But you have to also understand that God determined as a man that you would live this life in the flesh as a man. That was not accidental. And that, this gets touchy. We don't have time. If you want to talk in the hallway, we can. But we live in a culture that says you can define who you are. You decide. You decide, I'm not a man anymore. I'm a woman. I've seen interviews with people who they decide throughout the interview three or four times. They've changed back and forth between men and women in an interview. We used to be gender confused. Now it's gender fluid because God forbid we admit we're confused about anything. We live in a very confusing time where we have decided we can determine everything. And all the while God is like, I determined who you are. Now, if God doesn't care, if God's just throwing humans out, and it could be Nick, it could be Nicole, that's different. But that's not the God we believe in. We, be we don't even believe in a God who can just do amazing things. We believe in a God who is all loving. He only cares about us, and he only does things on purpose. And when you were conceived in your mother's womb, he decided that you would be in the flesh a man. That your DNA, that your chromosomes would speak to you being a man. You might even say, like, I don't feel. I've never felt manly. That's, that is stereotype, stereotypical. That's what that is. I mean, common, like, oh, men have to have a lot of muscles. Men need to be super successful. Men need to have nice, like, those are, those are cultural. What a man needs to be by a cultural determination changes all the time. But if you sweep that away and just admit what God made you biologically in your DNA, at your, at your cellular level, who he made you. There was a reason that you were made a man. There's a reason. Every day that you've ever gotten up, when you got up this morning, you had 23,000 breaths ahead of you. Why? You had 23,000 breaths ahead of you this morning as a man. Why? If, if humanity is on purpose and everything is about relationship with God, then why the distinction? Why make male and female? There's got to be a reason for it. So first, why humans? But second, masculinity. Why? Why me? And I remember I was 29 when I first said, I wonder why I was made a man. I get that God loves and he makes humans. I even got the relationship thing. But like, why, why a man? Is it random or not? So I'm reading Theology of the Body, which, by the way, if you get a chance, it's like 750 pages long, and it's awesome, by John Paul II. It, so I'm reading it because I was teaching a course on it. And I was reading one of the footnotes. In a footnote, John Paul II threw something out and then just moved past it. That's how awesome he was. He, moved, he threw these awesome things out in footnotes. And I read it, and I, I stopped. I kind of took a breath. And I put the book down. And I, I was in my office. I pushed my desk back. And I sat staring at my desk. And my mind was just flying like a million miles a minute. And I, I didn't touch the book again for three weeks. I couldn't, I couldn't, because what I had just read ended up changing me forever. And it's what I get to tell you right now. So do you guys know what the Old Testament was written in? What language? Nope. Hebrew. There we go. We got some of it in here. Hebrew. Ten points. Zach, ten points for the Hebrew. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. 
Uh, and Hebrew is a lot different than English. Uh, English, we have a lot of throwaway words. Uh, in English, we say, I love you. Uh, like, I love my wife, but I also love Mountain Dew a lot. And they should be very different loves. <laughs> they should be, anyway. Because that's, I mean, they, they border on similar, but they should be different. <laughs> so the words in, in Hebrew, though, are packed with meaning. And so in, in Hebrew, in the very first pages of Scripture, God is creating humans. He is speaking them into existence. He's creating light and trees and gravity and all the wonderful... He's setting the stage. He's creating the construct. And then he makes the key players. And God says, let us make man in our image. Let us, the Trinity, let's, let's make something like us. A creature that can be and live and interact like us. And we know God is love. God is an eternal exchange of love. The Father gives himself and... Uh, and loves the son and the son receives that love and in doing so in receiving is also giving himself back and that love is so real that it is the Holy Spirit. So that's kind of a classical under, way to understand the Trinity. So this Trinity, this eternal exchange of love says, you know what, let's make something like us. So he begins creating and he starts with male. It says, let us make man in our image, male and female, he created them. The word male in Hebrew, there's two Hebrew words for male, but in that account, the word male has a specific, specific meaning. The Hebrew word for male is zakar. So we got some Zacharys in the house. I know there's a, at least a couple. That's where we get the name Zachary, zakar. The word zakar did not just mean biology, like he'll have the man parts. Remember, this is the eternal exchange of love. God is creating something like him to interact with him, and he begins with this creature he's going to call male. And he uses a specific word. Now, that word was filled, packed with meaning, which... It's tough for us to understand hearing a word and having it unpacked. What I always say is that it's a lot like um, if I were to say Christmas morning. If I say Christmas morning, you don't think December 25th, 7 a.m. That's technically Christmas morning, but that's not what we think. We think of our kids wake us up at 4 a.m. And my son knew that it was a hockey stick that I wrapped, even though I wrapped it. I don't know how he knew. And... You just want coffee, and you're grumpy, and then the food comes, and the food is awesome, and it's a family, and it's, people show up, and it's wonderful, and there's wrapping paper. All of that is Christmas morning. When God invented humanity, when he spoke male and female into existence, he used specific words. And they had meaning, but, like, they are packed with meaning. They end up having, like, an eternity of meaning. So, gentlemen, when God invented us, when he invented male, there was a reason. And when he spoke the word zakar, he didn't even say zakar. Do you know what zakar means? Gentlemen, in this room, your meaning, your reason for being was spoken in the first pages of Scripture. God spoke the word zakar. What he actually said was remembrance. Male means remembrance. Now pause. How do we know, what does remembrance mean? Well, we have in the Exodus, when the children of Israel are being led out of Egypt, they institute the Passover. The Passover was to be a remembrance for the ages. And we know the Jewish people believed, when, or they knew, when you celebrated the Passover, you were taken outside of time, and you are made present in that one-time event. Jesus, at the Last Supper, says, do this in remembrance of me. We know that when you celebrate the Eucharist, you were taken outside of time, and you are made present in that one-time event. A, and a remembrance makes present. So instead of saying, I remember, like an intellectual exercise, it's better to think of re-member. You are a member again. You are made present. Gentlemen, before the Eucharist, gentlemen, before the Passover, we were remembrance. God created the male gender to make him present. That is what we mean. That, that is what man is supposed to be. At your deepest root, at your deepest meaning, you are created to be a remembrance. You're not even to be a remembrance. You are a remembrance of God to this world. Again, the Father is the initiator, and he gives himself. And that, that trinity, who begins with the Father, all things proceed from him. All good things come from God, says, you know what? Let's make something like us. We have man. We are created. We have it within our DNA to image God the Father. We are made to give like he gives. We're made for it. We are made for that, to pour ourselves out. It's actually in our DNA. It's in our anatomy. 
Think of our anatomy, uh, not for too long, but just think about it for a second. When, when you're thinking of uh, bodily being intimate, when a man experiences sexual climax, it's this moment that we're all going for, right? It's the moment that everybody's thinking about, that you're always trying to strive for. And you get that moment. You get it. You grab that moment. Say you take it. Even in the moment of taking, even if it's not even a godly, beautiful moment, you know what happens? You give yourself away. In the moment of sexual gratification, you give your DNA away. Yourself. It's yourself. That's you. Your body can't not give it away. Do you understand what I'm saying? In the moment that has become so broken and so messed up, <coughs> you still can't help but give yourself away because you're made to give. It's actually why you're here. As a man, well, I, you know, I'm here as a human to know and love God. But I experience relationship with him as a male. And I am made to be like him as a male. That's why men have this ability to image and know God the Father in a different way than women can because we are made to be fathers. Think about that. In, in, in your body, you are made to father. But we are not just bodies. We are spirit body composites. That means on all levels of your existence right now, bodily and spiritually, you are made to image God. You are made, when you leave here today, to go home into your homes and to bring God with you into every situation. As in your workplace, you go to your workplace, you bring God with you. You make God present wherever you go in a unique way because you're able to. There's a reason guys love Braveheart. There's a reason we love movies where it's one guy against an army and then he dies. Isn't that weird? You think you'd like it more if like he stood and then they all like obliterated and it was just him. But we don't. We love it when it's one guy and he stands for what is right and then he dies. What if at the end of Braveheart he had been like, wait, 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 wait. Okay, you can take my freedom. Just don't take my life. Okay? Just let me live. I'm super scared right now. I think I just peed my kilt. Right? Yeah, I did. I gotta go. All right, my fault. We would hate that, right? Think if that's how the movie ended. The army is charging like, oh gosh, okay, and then they run away. There's a reason we have the idea of coward, like of being yellow. Like, you're ye are you yellow? We don't want to be yellow. Sorry about your shirt there, sir. <laughs> but your phone did go off, so that's two strikes. You got one more, one more. Somebody call him now, call him now. There's a reason we like those stories of like one man against everything. Because that's what life is supposed to be like. It is us standing for what is good, what is right, and pouring ourselves out. And if they're ever in doubt of that, you just need to look at a cross. Get yourself a dang crucifix. I tell men, don't ever, for the rest of your life, don't ever be more than arm's length from a crucifix. Not a cross, a crucifix. Because it's why you're here. It is what male means. How do we know? Because Christ didn't come as a gender-neutral, like androgynous, just wispy creature just moving around. Like, he came as a man. He was born as a boy. He grew into a man to show us what a man does. That's what he came for. He showed what masculinity looks like. And he bled out for us. Gentlemen, I, I'm sorry to tell you, <laughs> but at the core, that's why you're here, to die. You live through Christ. You live through everything he pours out into your life. But it is so that you can image him. And that's what masculinity does. It makes God present. And love comes through that sacrifice, that passion. It's why you're here. And I remember reading it going, that's why my marriage has failed. I've never really poured myself out. Because everywhere I go, I'm looking to get. I got my feet planted. I'm looking to get from this world around me. And that's not why I'm here. What if I stop trying to get from this world? What if instead of planting my feet, I just picked up my feet? What if I'm clenching onto things, I just let go? What if I stopped needing stuff from this world and I just kept my eyes up? And then you realize why you're here. Gentlemen, it is good to be a man, but it is not easy. It is not made to be easy. We live in a world that has lied to us from our birth to this moment. And all the while, God has been saying, no, that's not why you're here. Put your eyes up on me and then bleed out. That doesn't sound fun, but you know, it was fun to be around Christ. You know that, right? It's fun to be around him. 
He did a lot of, like, one, his first miracle, he made booze at a wedding. That's awesome. I like that man. If it was Guinness, that'd be better. Just Guinness at a wedding, that'd be the best. He walked around, he would, one time 5,000 people forgot lunch. <laughs> scripture says men. Scripture says 5,000 men. And I love it because I just picture all of them going, you know what, I brought the lawn chair. What more do you want from me? I just, I'm a man, not a machine. I don't know what to tell you. I didn't bring salt or napkins. I'm sorry. <laughs> and what does Jesus do? Ah, no big deal. Watch this. And then there's food for everybody. It was awesome to be around him. But when it really came to being a man, we know what he did. Gentlemen in this room, you were made to be Zakar. You were made to live your life making God present in every conversation, in every heartbeat, in every breath, in every relationship, in every job, in every situation you're in. You open yourself to God and say, listen, so first and foremost, you are the bride of Christ. I know that's uncomfortable, but just picture yourself in a nice white wedding dress because that's what we all are, men and women. We are first and foremost the bride of Christ. But in this everyday life down here, you are to image God the Father. So you say, God, whatever you have to give, I will be that in this world. And you find that you change as a man. You're not so passive, aggressive, and sour. You're not so confused, because when you get up in the morning and you swing your legs off the bed, you know why you're here. And there is a lack of fatherhood in this world. I mean, I've experienced it, but, you know, we have school shootings right now. We have a, a little rash of violence going on. It's all young men. Apart from one of them, none of them had dads. We blame, we blame guns. We blame the media. We, there's no dads around. And I think, uh, how many more minutes do I have? Where's the guy with the thing, the minute guy? I, I got plenty of time? Okay. Good. He's like, oh, I was asleep. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> you're good. Just keep talking. <laughs> five minutes. Five. I just, I need five more. I'm just kidding. Sorry, Mike. <laughs> but you know, <laughs> so I'm making fun of you guys, so you're next. So. <laughs> so if we could actually, you know, guys, if we actually got this, for real, if, I don't know how many people there are. If all 10 of us, I'm bad with numbers, if we all left today knowing this, we just went home, okay, I don't know what this is going to look like in my life, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to go home and I'm going to be a man. I'm going to stop being a little boy. I'm going to stop being a pig. I'm going to be an actual man in this world. I am. I'm going to change. I'm going to make God present wherever I go. I'm not going to assert my independence. I'm not going to say what I need. I'm not going to put my foot down and say what I deserve and get my rights. I'm going to stop kissing like John Wayne. Do you guys know, do you guys know who John Wayne was? I grew up on John Wayne movies, and I like John Wayne a lot. True Grit was one of my favorite movies of my entire life, but I hated the way John Wayne would kiss people because John Wayne would be standing there, and then the girl would be here, and his hand would come up, and then, <laughs> and then he'd push her away. It wasn't a kiss, but it was scary. But, like, it's a very, like, that's what a man does. I see that. I want it. <laughs> and that, that was always weird to me. Because we're told that's what a guy does. You get what you want. You see something and you grab at it. That's like anti what a man actually does. That's weak. That's easy. It's easy to just spend your life grabbing at what you want. What is not easy is to be an actual man. To say, in this world, I'm not here for me. I'm never here for me. I'm here for you and for them. That's it. I'm here for you and then I'm here for them. And if we could get that, you would Cedar Rapids would transform. The state would, we, the world would change from the people in this room. And it might. We might get it. But it takes us a while sometimes. Because we do have that salty napkin side of us where we're like, <laughs> I don't know. So, if we can't get this, I beg men to understand this. Because just like there's a Hebrew word for male, and it's filled with meaning and depth, and purpose. There's also a, female, or a, word for, a Hebrew word for female. There's also a reason that women were invented. That the idea of male and female, remember, God, the Father who gives and receives and gives and is the Holy Spirit, that eternal exchange of love says, you know what, let's make something like us. 
Let's make something like us that can interact. First, we're going to start with somebody who just gives and gives. And then he creates female. And the word for female is uh, negava. So we have Zakar and Zachary. Negava, I don't know any negis at all, ever. If you know one, tell me. But the word negava in Hebrew is just as filled with meaning. And I always, and I know we have some ladies in the audience, and I wish women could hear this talk as well. This is, I give the same talk for men and for women when it comes to this. But I desperately wish that men could understand this. If this is going to take a while, fine. But understand this. The word for, for woman, negava, literally, so when God invented the idea of the female gender, he invented and created with all this meaning behind it. The word female literally means to be open. Technically, it means to be punctured. So we see anatomically, biologically, um, we, I mean, even just in anatomy, the, the man is the giver, he gives himself, the woman receives her, him into her, and, and technically that's where the idea of puncturing comes from. But the idea behind woman means openness, to be open, to receive. That's why we are the bride of Christ, because we are receptive. Everything from God is receptive. But in imaging the Trinity, he creates a being that will give, and he creates a being that will receive. Gentlemen, do you know what that means? Every woman you've ever known, your mom, your sisters, your aunts, your coworkers, your daughters, your wives, it means that every woman you've ever met or looked at or thought about, the only reason they are on this earth is to know God and to receive from him. That's it. Men were made to give. Women were made to receive. You're going to want to fight me on this, but it's, there's no way around it. Every woman you've ever met and wanted something from was not made to be taken from, but made to be given to. John Paul II said, it is first and foremost the man who loves, and it is the woman who is loved. That's the scenario. That's the setup. Well, that's not fair if I just give and give and give. What if they don't give back? Talk to Jesus. <laughs> Nowhere in Scripture, he's like, they're just not nice all the time. I fed all those idiots. I fed them. and No, what does he do? He comes to this world. He does amazing things. But when it really comes down to it, he lets them kill him. And he asks God's forgiveness for them. Why? Because that is what he came to do, to give. As a famous missionary growing up, um, he went to the Fiji Islands, him and a couple other people. And back then, it was, um, it was way back in the day, and they were very, very violent, savage. Um, and on the way there, the boatman who was taking them said, you know that they're going to kill you right when you get there, right? And he said, yeah, it's fine. We died before we came here. I'm dead already. I, I died way long time ago. This is what I came for. Gentlemen, you were put on this earth to give. That's why you're here. You were put on this earth to bleed out. Because that's what a man does. We'll talk about it how in the, in the other talks. But that's what male means. It means when you think about a woman and what you could get from that woman, all the while, all she's doing is waiting to receive. Now, for the women in the room, but also for the men, the woman was made to receive one thing. God. That's it. Every woman in your life is desperately waiting. At, at her core, at her nature, she is openness. Just waiting to receive what she is created to receive, and that would be God's love. And just to be honest, we have a virtual vacuum of men in this world. A, it is an utter vacuum out there. You work in it. You live in it. You see it. There are little boys, and then it's mostly pigs. It's just raw desire. It's raw need and emptiness grabbing at this world trying to get filled. And all the while that that is happening, you have an entire gender of people who are just desperate to know that God only loves them and only made them like they are to love them. That's it. Now, for a man to know that you're here for a relationship with God, that's not mamby-pamby. It's not just emotions. It's not all of that. It's also, no, God is proud of you. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Who does not want their dad to look at them and be like, I am so proud of you. 
That's why you get in Scripture. At the end of our lives, what we want to hear when we get to heaven is, well done, good and faithful servant. I am proud of you. As a man, we want that. We want to know that God is proud of us, that we have what it takes. Years ago, I started, like, picking locks and, uh, like, learning. I learned to fly planes and scuba dive and urban survival and getting out of trunks of cars. Like, just weird. I just got obsessed with surviving. And it was because I realized I want to be up for any situation that happens. I want to be the one who's ready for it. And that's, that's really fun as well. It's fun to do all those things. But I recognized at the core, I mean, I didn't stop learning all those things. But at the core, I did it because I really wanted to be that guy. I wanted to be Jason Bourne really bad. I did. Like, I, I wanted to be that guy that they would make a movie about. Because we all want that. We all want to, like, it's burning. People are, and we're, like, saving orphans. Like, carrying, like, six of them and running into fire. We want that, because that's our side. But you know the, what woman means? The receptivity? All women need, now that doesn't mean passive. It doesn't mean stay at home and stay in the kitchen and barefoot and pregnant. It has nothing to do with your job. Men and women, this has nothing to do with the job you do. Be a plumber, be the president, be um, unemployed. It doesn't matter. None of that affects your dignity and your worth. Underneath all of it, as men, we are made to give and pour ourselves out. Women are made to be receptive, to receive the love of God. Women should never have had a moment of their lives that they doubt their worth, or they doubt if they're beautiful, or if they doubt if they're dignified, or if they doubt if you would die for them. Every man should walk through their life letting every woman around them know, you're worth it, you're worth it, I don't need to know you, I would die for you, you're amazing, God loves you just like you are, and pouring out that love. And when that doesn't happen, then you get utter confusion on this side too. You take it five seconds and think about our culture, our society. We, I gotta redefine things. I mean, I, I, I don't need to just redefine marriage. I need to redefine my gender. I need to redefine everything about life because I can't make sense of it. I can't, I don't know, I, I guess I was born a man, but that doesn't make any sense to me because I don't see any, I don't know what that means. I was born a woman, but th what does that even mean? There's no meaning. People are getting up out of bed every morning going, I have no clue. I don't know, I'm gonna do the best I can. And they are, this world is doing the best it can given the situation that they've been dealt. But you know the antidote to all that confusion? The antidote is for you guys today to just say, okay, I didn't know. I'm sorry. I didn't know. I didn't know what it meant to be a man. I thought it was all these other things. You understand, right? There's no blame. I'm, there's not a blame thing. It's not like a judgment thing. I, I, I destroyed a bunch of people in my life that I'm still atoning for. What it does mean is there can be a difference between yesterday and today. I can tell you firsthand, porn changes for you when you start to realize what a man is for and what a woman is for. Porn changes. Lust changes. Your marriage changes. If you go home today, no matter how long you've been married, you go home today and walk in the door and say, honey, I'm sorry. I didn't know. I haven't been being what I was supposed to. And I'm going to endeavor to do it differently now. Things change. Next time you go to work, walk in the front door of your workplace, whether you're the boss or the lowest peon employee, walk into that place saying, I'm only here to give. Go into the gas station to pay for gas. You're only there to give. Finding this, Zakar, changed how I pay for gas. I have gone into gas stations before, and it used to just be like, you know, it's a cashier, it's a nobody. It's, it's, it, these people have nothing to do with my life. I just need to pay for gas and go. And I walk in, and I remember the first time it happened, I was gonna pay, and I looked up, and I just saw the guy. He was a guy, a real human, who didn't know why he was there. And I was like, hey, how are you, man? And I didn't know him, I was in a different state. And the guy was like, in the machine, he's like, what? I said, how are you doing? He's like, Actually, I'm having a really bad day. Okay, let's talk. And he stepped to the side. There's people waiting to pay, and he's over here just wanting to talk. And I'm like, oh, I did not. I don't care. I'm sorry. I didn't intend this. I was new. I was new. <laughs> sorry I asked. I got to go. My baby's crawling around the, par the parking lot somewhere. I got to go. It's changed the way I get on airplanes. I used to get on an airplane, and because I, I fly a lot, I sit down between two total strangers, put the headphones in, you put the, the book in front of you, the hood over your head, to put out every signal that you don't want to talk to somebody. 
And that, because this is my world, this is my time, I'm crammed between two sweaty people, I don't care. And now I get on a plane, I don't even bring headphones, I don't bring a book, I just sit down and I'm just waiting for it. I sit down on the plane and I'll do this, I have this spiel, I'm always like, hi, my name's Nick, we'll be flying together today. <laughs> and I love it, because you see them all like, oh crap, we got a talker, okay. Um, <laughs> headphones, can I get headphones? Two pair. I love it. And, but here's the thing. What I always do is I start, I say like, okay, my name's Nick. I do the joke. And they're like, huh. And then I say, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm on my way home. I was at a Catholic event. I'm a Catholic speaker. I uh, I'm, can't wait to see my family. I'm excited to go home. And then I end it. I drop it. So I put something out there that I'm a talker, but I don't force it. And I just, and I, I won't say another word the rest of the trip. Nine times out of ten, before wheels up, they are talking to me. Oh, you're Catholic, Catholic speaker. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't always Catholic. I became, whoa, why would you do that? Why would you become, why would you, do, I was Catholic and I left. Why would you, not, nine times out of ten. By the time I land, I, I have the person's email address. We keep in touch. I have, I've literally had it where within minutes, the person is crying. Like, she left me, I don't know. And the other guy's like, do you know him? I'm like, I don't know this person. <laughs> you and I know him the same amount. But when you realize that every tick of your clock is not yours, that God gives it to you to give away, then your minutes change. The minutes of your day change. The reason for being changes. Well, I'm going to get trampled. Yeah. That's par for the course. Yeah, but what if people don't reciprocate? Yeah, they never do. But that's not why you're here. You're not here for reciprocation. You're not here to get. You're here to give. That's why you were put on this earth. Now, God loves you. God's not mad at you. God's not miffed at you. He's not disappointed in you. You haven't surprised him with your behavior. Well, but if you knew what's inside, ah, God does. He's not, he's not shocked by you. But all he's ever wanted is to, like, to give you a unique relationship with him, to show him what God the Father actually is, to pour into your life, and then for you to walk out the doors of anywhere that you are and just change this world by your gift. That's what you're made for. Biologically, biologically, we do this. Uh, we know the father loves the son and gives himself, and the son receives, or the son receives and gives himself back, and that love is so real that it is the Holy Spirit. We have the man who images God the Father, and he gives of himself, and the woman receives him into her, but in doing so is also giving herself back, and that love becomes so real that nine months later you have to give it a name. Do you know the first command in all of Scripture? Be fruitful and multiply. And he did not mean grow bananas and do math. not sanitized in any way. God the Trinity creates humans and says, now you go do it. Like literally, go do it. Go create. Like us, as constant giving and receiving, go create. And our bodies do that. There's an actual gift. There's actual receptivity. And that actually creates another life. But in our actual lives, in our physical world that we live in, we're also spiritual. And we can go out of here and begin to create life wherever we are. In the gloomiest of situations, we can create life. I have a friend who was raped at an ATM in an inner city late at night and conceived. She got pregnant from a rape. And people were like, what are you going to do? She's like, what do you mean, what am I going to do? Out of this um, like, incredibly horrifying moment comes life? Are you kidding me? That's amazing. That's, that's phenomenal. Out of the worst situation, out of the most broken marriages, I know a man who came to one of my TOB courses. He came, he had been openly cheating on his wife for like, they were married for 40 years. And he had been openly cheating. She had called me ahead of time. Should he even come? He said he would show up. I was like, yeah, absolutely. And he came, he came every week for 14 weeks. He and his wife sat in the back just weeping and weeping. And now they teach theology of the body. There's nothing. There's no point of your life that you're too far gone. This is not for the youth. This is not for some certain demographic. This is for man. This is for every male that you will ever meet. Walk out of here as a gift. Walk out of here knowing I'm only here to know you and to pour out what you give to this world. And every footstep changes for you. Every heartbeat changes for you. Every time you breathe begins to change. Every soul you meet changes in your eyes. It's harder to lust after someone when you know that they are just dying for God's love. When you know that you're here to give that love as a gift and step back and not need anything. 
Later this afternoon, we'll talk about the practicals of that. But I want to encourage you guys. Be encouraged. Be excited. You, you have this special gift of being a man with all of the fire and passion that we were given as men. And we can go into this world and use it as a transformative healing action in the name of God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.